what is the actual government at this point? Uh, where does the sovereignty actually reside? Um, what is this government turning into? Is it turning into something that is incompatible with our constitutionally guaranteed form of government? I'm very excited to moderate this and just to start off with a word of positivity, I'm going to introduce our topic, I'm going to introduce our speakers, and then we are going to jump right in to this very timely topic today. Some overarching questions Dreyer poses in his book are, is it really that bad? Is our government really on the brink of totalitarianism? This is America, right? Is it really appropriate to be comparing it to a totalitarian communist regime? That seems a little bit drastic, no? But in light of these questions, I would like to read or just recall some changes that have happened in the past 18 months in the relationship between Americans and their government. It's been a little bit of a foggy 18 months, so I want to just recall this for everybody here. The government, either state and or local and or federal, um, has defined private businesses as essential um, or non-essential and force the closures of the non-essential. The Trump administration has spent more money than any other government arguably in the history of the world. The government threatened legal action against business owners that tried to stay open, feed their families, and serve their customers. The government has defined how far away we can safely be from our neighbor. If you're in California, last Thanksgiving, the government issued guidance that said how to conduct your Thanksgiving dinner, what type of serving utensils you should use to conduct said dinner, where guests should sit relative to one another, and who is allowed to use the restroom of the host, who, whoever is hosting Thanksgiving, and how they should access the restroom. Many state governments imposed curfews on us last summer. Many state governments are mandating that our children, our very young children, wear masks to school. And the federal government has mandated that companies with 100 or fewer employees need to have every single employee vaccinated or face upwards of $12,000 per violation. And the list goes on. It is in this context that we discuss the topic of this panel, which is government. And it's in the light of Rod Dreyer's book, that we discuss this. And with that, I'm going to introduce our esteemed panelists. The first is Lance Christensen. He brings nearly two decades of public policy and political experience to the role of chief strategist for Fix California in preparing to put a substantial education reform measure on the November 2022 ballot. Outside of government, Christensen served as director of the pension reform project for Reason Foundation, setting the stage for major reforms in state and local retirement funding across the country. Mr. Christensen urged his bachelor's degree in English from BYU and a master in public policy from Pepperdine School of Public Policy. James Polis creates and advises brands and enterprises at the intersection of technology, media, and design. He is co-founder and executive director of the American Mind at the Claremont Institute and the co-founder and publisher of Return at New Founding. Polis holds a PhD in government from Georgetown University and a BA in political science from Duke University. William Vogley is senior editor at the Claremont Review of Books and author of Never Enough, America's Limitless Welfare State and The Pity Party, a mean-spirited diatribe against liberal compassion. Vogley received his PhD in political science from Loyola University of Chicago and was the William E. Simon Visiting Professor at Pepperdine School of Public Policy in 2016. So our first topic, we're just gonna start right off. Um, at the beginning of Dreyer's book, he talks about how renowned priest Father Kolokovich prepared Slovakian Christians for persecution because he knew the church would be no match for communism. A very scary thought. He correctly predicted that the government would first control the clergy and in turn the church faithful. In this past year, Americans have witnessed almost every single religious institution deemed non-essential by our government with arguably non-existent pushback against the government by Christian church leadership. <clears throat> Question for the panelists. 
Is there a desire for churches to push back against the soft tyranny of government individually or collectively? And if so, what does this look like and why have we not been, been seeing it? Lance, would you like to start us off? Sure, appreciate it. Thank you again uh, for Thank you again for having us here. I'm excited to be back. I was here actually when this building was built, and uh, it's great to uh, be back about 17 years later. Um, the question on religion and church and state and all those things, I think it's very interesting. It's fascinating to me because I think you need to go one step further beyond the church, and I think it needs to be the family, which Rod uh, points out a ton in his book. The family really is the basic unit of society. And if you can't fundamentally deal with that um, issue, the church, by and large, struggles to gain a foothold in society. And so I think dealing first with the family and a lot of the corrective measures that need to happen there, I think, are important. I worked for 17 years in the state legislature, and um, one of the things that was fascinating to me was watching a lot of people come in and say, hey, I have the perfect policy. And my mind would always go back, you know, as they want to write legislation to what Professor Gordon Lloyd uh, used to teach. He had three principles. He said, one, we should ask a question, should government do X? Then he asked the second question, if we decided that government should do something, what level should do it? Federal government, state, local? And then once we've decided that, the third question should be, well, how much? Is that 100%, 50%, 5%? And I think presupposing that is what does the family do? Like, what is the family's involvement in a civic, civic society? And that's what we're supposed to be teaching and appreciate the panel before because they kind of led up to that. So getting back to your question about the church and, 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 and how it interacts with the state, I think we've got to fix the family first before we can deal with the church. Lance, um, as far as that goes, don't you think that the church, at priests, religious leaders, and whatnot, uh, pastors, them inviting that sort of pushback would empower individuals in the family to further provide that um, that bulwark against basically government deeming those in, those institutions not essential. Yeah, no, I think that the family is uh, is uh, again essential there and can through um, through the church which used to be stronger in community, right? I mean, you have the, the Black Rob Regiment back in the Revolution that uh, really made the Revolution happen. It was the church that moved forward on the civil rights or the Civil War and the freeing of the slaves and the civil rights movement. Go down the list. I, I think when we were home, stuck with our families, 24 hours a day, I'm a father of five. My youngest is five, my oldest is 17. Um, he was born the last week I was here at Pepperdine. And I look back and finally think, we can only spend so much time together before really we're bursting the seams. And we need to decide what was most important for us. And the faith, our church, uh, that life was important. And getting back that community face to face was, uh, I think, one of the best things we could have done. But the government did everything it could to stop it. And you'd mentioned about all the regulations and Thanksgiving. You skipped one. And I'm surprised because Governor Newsom actually restricted us from playing our clarinets on Thanksgiving. <laughs> Um, it's actually in the, in the restrictions, and so uh, we didn't play any clarinets on Thanksgiving. Uh, we just didn't have any, so. Thank you, Lance. James, what are you thinking? Well, I'm certainly not going to uh, <clears throat> contradict Lance here on this, uh, but I do think that, um, that the, the difficulty flows uh, in the opposite direction to, to a degree as well. Um, I think that there has been uh, to a degree, an experiment in America over a couple generations where um, where people have attempted to move the, the focus of their sense of the sacred out of organized religion and onto the family um, in the hope that that focus would be sufficient to maintain our culture as it once was. Um, I think that that experiment has been a failure. Um, I think that uh, I forgot which, uh, which Christian college it is that, that put out a very memeable uh, poll recently where uh, fewer uh, millennial and, and Gen Z kids polled uh, identified themselves as Christian as identified themselves as one of the you know, 69 and counting flavors of queer available today. <laughs> Um, this is a powerful indicator, and it's one piece of evidence, but it, it resonates strongly with lots of other evidence out there. 
uh, that that placing um, the the burden of uh, maintaining a sense of sacredness in the culture on the family alone, and particularly on the nuclear family alone, has not been a success. Uh, I think people need to confront this. Um, it is. Uh, it is daunting to look at church attendance numbers, not just in the US, but around the world, and feel like, well, you know, if everyone just, you know, pulls it together and drags themselves to, uh, you know, their place of worship on Sunday, then we'll, we'll, get it, we'll get it back to the way that it was. We're not gonna get it back the way that it was. Um, and even if the numbers go way up and, you know, the sort of public morality changes, it's, we're still not gonna be in the same world. Um, and I think, you know, to the, to the Vax point, um, what is so telling is that the, the vaccine policies that have been um, implemented uh, and handed out um, have been imposed through parts of the government over which no citizen or group of citizens has any sort of control. Uh, this should raise some questions, right? What is the actual government at this point? Uh, where does the sovereignty actually reside? Um, what is this government turning into? Is it turning into something that is incompatible with our constitutionally guaranteed form of government? Is it turning into something that is fundamentally hostile to the American way of life? And I think based on the fact that these vaccine policies have no internal self-justification, they are not self-explanatory, uh, it's clear that they're being done for reasons that do not have to do specifically with uh, the particular risks uh, posed by COVID-19. We've seen policies thrown around, reversed, changed, extended, altered, and widened uh, without regard to uh, the particularities of the virus. Um, and so you have to ask, you know, well then if it's not because, you know, the science says so, then what is it because of? Why is it that, you know, if you, uh, if you participate in a riot, you are engaged in sacred political activity, but if you try to play your clarinet, or if you try to take communion, you are a, a, a threat to the, the body politic. Um, this suggests to me that what is going on with our government um, is about much more than any one disease or any one concept of public health, and that it is in fact about changing our form of government without our consent. Something I would like the panel to consider is why is there so much fear from church leadership of our government? I'm Catholic and I was talking to my priest right before COVID. For those of you who know anything about Catholicism, you know that we go to confession. So I was thinking, if this thing lasts a long time, I need to go to confession because I have a few sins to confess before this whole thing shuts down. So I made sure to go right before everything shut down. I was talking to my priest and I said, what is going to happen if they de deem our church unessential? And he said, Julia, don't worry. We answer to our own church hierarchy. We have, for those of you who know anything about Catholicism, very hierarchical. We have our own church hierarchy, and we answer to them. And I was thinking, wow, that's great. Less than a week later, our church <laughs> shut down. And I was thinking, hmm, where did that confidence in that church hierarchy come from when, for lack of a better, better term, they folded like wet tortillas when the government of California said, absolutely not, you're no longer going to stay open. So for the panel, why is there this reluctance? I know people in our church who would have loved to get arrested going to church. And our clergy did not give them that opportunity. So why do you think that is? Why was there such cowardice in this very clear state? And it's not even that we necessarily needed to fight and stand by the doors, but the minimum that church leadership could have done is to fight our government to be deemed essential rather than non-essential for those of you Californians. For those Californians, you know that marijuana shops were deemed essential and churches were not. So why do you think there's such reluctance from church leadership to stand up when basically the guidelines for them had already been written? William, what do you think? Well, I'm reluctant to um, draw any uh, um, more than provisional general <laughs> rules 
from this very unique set of circumstances involving the uh, coronavirus. Um, it, you know, I think five or 10 years we look back on it, we're gonna be not so surprised that you had a highly dangerous, highly contagious disease and that both government policy and the, the social response to those policies were very uneven and, and um, erratic um, and uncertain and had many contradictions. Um, uh, it, it's, it's not as though presented with this crisis all of a sudden in the spring of 2020 that there was a, um, a nice blueprint sitting on a shelf somewhere that people could pull out and say, aha, this is what we do in response to this. Um, so uh, the things you say are all right about the excesses, um, about the unfairnesses, uh, uh, and so forth. Um, but uh, you told me privately you wanted a devil's advocate uh, uh, occasionally. All right, so, he so here's mine, which is that, um, um, that I think that there's, um, uh, between the uncertainty about what to do about this problem and how to, to minimize it, um, and the fact that in sort of the terms that economists would use, that um, a, a contagious disease, uh, lethal in, in certain populations, presents us with the ultimate sort of negative externality. Just by walking into a room, you can do something harmful to the people who are already there when, when this virus is, is around. Um, that it's not, um, uh, uh, that there are, uh, there are explanations other than um, just below the surface totalitarianism that explains the list of, of policies that were, were spooled out over the past 18 uh, months. All that having been said, um, it is also clear, uh, as I think uh, uh, James, uh, all, all three of you have, have uh, indicated one in different ways, that there, there seem to be quite a few people um, making policies, enforcing them, and submitting to them whose um, enthusiasm for this kind of thing goes beyond complying with the particular exigencies uh, imposed upon us in 2020 and 2021. Um, there do seem to be um, more than a few people in, in here and there uh, in the government who rather like the idea of, of being able to issue these edicts and know that, that people will be um, uh, forced to comply. So I think that um, the, um, the, you know, the general response is that we have to, we have to be vigilant. We have to, it's one thing to say this, that this is an exceptional set of circumstances and exceptional problems um, and exceptional responses were uh, inevitable. It's another thing to say that people who want to make this exception become the rule need to be um, uh, given a great deal of deference. They don't. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, Lance. I think uh, let's agree that um, there was a lot of uncertainty about the science and the public health issues. I think we all could acknowledge that. For the first several months, each one of us wondered if it was going to come for us next or a family member, and, and some of us lost maybe a family member or two, or maybe didn't have any at all. So that was one. I think there's a general concern. But uh, moving from a theoretical to a practical public policy issue, the church has had lots to fear. Uh, one is a state government who has become over aggressive in really um, going after churches. I've developed a document as the former chief of staff for a state senator. Over the last 20 years, I have 30 pages worth of bills that the legislature has introduced and by and by over the period of years, increasingly hostile to family, to religion, to church, to faith, and what we see now is only because the frog's been boiled, right? And so what the church has had to deal with are real, um, real pressures upon tax-exempt ex status, right? Property taxes, a huge amount. If you're a Catholic, uh, they've been coming after you know, a lot of legislation in other places for some of the other uh, previous actions by priests years ago or even currently. Uh, professional licensing. If you're a member of a church that continues to practice or in the laity, uh, you're a dentist or a doctor. They might come after you. That's a real threat. Um, threatening of the sanctuary itself. 
many people worried that they might come and take it over. Uh, those that uh, are priests and, and take uh, penitent or uh, the pe priest penitent privilege, um, there has been legislation that attacked that as well. Uh, who's to say that the legislature wouldn't come after that? As, especially under the guise of these public health orders. And an emergency order the governor has yet to give up uh, after almost 20 months here. Other financial threats that continue the, the, the ability to actually have private schools through a lot of these churches. Um, and for some churches, this is the bread and butter for those that minister within those churches. So the threat is real for the churches. And in California, it's not just some theoretical loss of religious liberty, but it's the ability to actually practice uh, your profession, your daily life, to, to go about your business and educate your children. Lance, uh, yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll ahead, jump James. in real quick. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think both of my esteemed panelists here are quite right to draw our attention or our memories back to the early days of COVID and to the, uh, the inconsistencies and ultimately the, the incredible about face that we saw coming out of the regime. I mean, you know, cards on the table. I sat my family down Christmas of, I guess, 2019 and said, oh, hey, you know, the, 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 the suits on Twitter are making a stir about this thing in China and I think we should have a plan. And I seemed like the weirdo, you know, I ordered the, the N95s that came in February. I was, you know, the, the media was telling me that I was the bad guy for not immediately sending those to a hospital instead of keeping them in my closet. Um, you know, the media was telling me that I was a racist because I, I did not go down to the local Chinatown wet market and start buying as much sort of like, you know, soggy uh, protein as I could. Um, I was there and, you know, I was the crazy COVID hawk. And then as time went on, somehow I had miraculously turned into the crazy COVID dove. So, you know, why did that happen? Um, and I think it's, it's revealing uh, looking back on that time, uh, it's, it's revealing in what sense and it's sort of why it is that we're here now at this point talking about totalitarianism. You know, it's quite a heavy word and, you know, with, with due respect and love to Rod, you know, we're not just talking about totalitarianism because you wrote this great book and we need a sort of hook to talk about the book. The book is great. Um, why the vaccine policies? Why the big shift? Um, it's, it's because uh, the, the folks in charge realized at some point in the process that they had a bigger opportunity on their hands than they realized, I think. And what they realized was, you know, coming off of 2008, coming off of 2016, um, a whole series of, of breakdowns in uh, America's uh, geopolitical position in the world, uh, the collapse of the war in Afghanistan, the collapse of, uh, of the, the currency, really, you know, the, the full faith and credit of the American people and the dollar that we've seen over the past, you know, since, since 2008, huge uh, explosion of spending, um, and, and the, the sort of disintegration of all of these value propositions that were baked into the regime as we know it. Oh, send your kid to the best college they can get into. That's gone. Oh, you know, save up money, buy a house. These things are collapsing. Basic elements of the social contract that we have grown up with, that we have raised kids with, are, are falling apart. And when the folks in charge realized that yes, everyone would just kind of accept, whether through paralysis or fear or a, a appreciation of compliance, whatever it is, a, a loss of will, that people would just accept lockdowns uh, with no end in sight, um, with no uh, plausible account for exactly why, and with no citizen participation, they started to think. Well, you know, we've, we've kind of destroyed our financial system, we've destroyed our economy, uh, all of our, you know, military adventures over the past 20 years have been failures. Um, we created this kind of digital system of technology uh, and we thought it was gonna complete our, our form of, you know, American-led Western rules-based international order, whatever you wanna call it. Um, and instead, it, it, you know, it resulted in Trump being elected president. Uh, this was a huge humiliation. Uh, for the folks in charge, and they realized that they needed to make a sweeping change in order to retain power. And in order to do that, uh, they had to use uh, COVID and use the lockdowns. I mean, this is out in the open, you know, this is not conspiracy theorizing here. You go and read the, the BlackRock reports in Europe from 2019, and they say, we need to use this. Uh, the, the economic system in the West is collapsing, and we've got to, we gotta do a hard reboot, you know, a great reset. This is, this is what's going on. Um, and, and so the structure that they're building for us is really a social credit system. We, we see it happening right now all the way through, you know, uh, Hollywood, entertainment, uh, academia, finance, uh, government, you know, 
uh, government agencies with, with no oversight, even you know, the intelligence community, everyone's on board uh, with, with the, new, the new public religion. Uh, and if you do not participate, you will be punished. Um, and so that's why we're here talking about uh, totalitarianism. Uh, the, the folks in charge, you know, are, are, it's not just the first order of effects where you know, y yes, you have to wear that mask, no, you can't leave your house. It's about the logic that's going on behind it and the way that this crisis is being repurposed in order to create a fundamentally new system of governance so that the, uh, the terms of how people and their government and their technology relate to one another are, are reset without much input from us. Thank you, James. That dovetails into our next large topic. And actually, before we get there, uh, just a reminder, if you have questions, please feel free to write them down. And then we have two wonderful assistants, I believe, coming and grabbing them, and we'll take those in the last 15 minutes of the panel. Thank you. Panelists, how much do you think this, as uh, James was referring to, and as Dreyer talks about the soft totalitarianism, can be attributed to government action versus woke capitalism? And for the classical liberals in the crowd who are advocates of market type of transactions, why, presumably, is the, um, this corporate structure that we have pushing a lot of the agenda of the government? Why, why is that relationship the way that it is? Um, and what does that mean about the relationship between our corporate structure and our current government, governance and government? It's loaded. Um, I, I come from a religious family, Latter-day Saint. Anybody who lived through uh, Proposition 8 in 2008 can remember a totalitarian government um, in California where then Mayor Newsom declared that marriage could be given between a man and a man, a woman and a woman, and despite the public coming out in 2008 and saying 50, what is it, 58 to 42 or 57, 43, that they didn't want that system, and yet um, the idea was that um, you know it was we, he was going to do whatever he wanted, uh, whether we liked it or not. Right was the famous saying. Yeah. Um, I first came upon Rod um, years ago when I read a, a quote where he said, "Small, local, old, and particular are to be preferred to big, global, new, and abstract." And as a man who worked at a libertarian think tank who believed in free markets and free minds, um, the idea of unlimited exchange and economic development, I think, is appealing on one level. But if it's not based or um, uh, surrounded, if there's not a foundation of some sort of morality with that, then the idea of going to China and getting things really cheap and other places makes no sense if your next door neighbor can't feed his family. And um, I, I've seen that in government policy where most of the stuff that happens underneath the dome of the Capitol in Sacramento is completely antithetical to families and to businesses and to the economy. And it's all about power and control. And there really are only two parties in, in California or in California governance. There's the party of, of the kneecapper and there's the party of cats. And unfortunately, cats don't like being told what to do. And so the kneecappers win. It's about power and control. And if you have it continued at the state local or at the state level, the local governments as arms of the state really have no ability, desire, or will to go out and push back. And I think that's what we have to do. What happened in Virginia this last week, I think, reanimates the discussion about what local government can and should do, especially when it comes down to school boards and counties and cities. We really have to take over those institutions if we're going to overtake the state and other places as well. Lance, how much do you think the right has actually also become the kneecapping party, considering uh, folks like J.D. Vance, for example, calling for use of the government to do conservatives' will? Well, I, again, I think you have to frame that all within the idea of uh, whether liberal democracy has hit its end or not, um, and if there's an alternative there. And I don't know if we're still continuing underneath the, the, the best of all worst systems, we're not, I, I don't know. I, I think we're at a precipice, and I've got to figure it out in my own head where we're going from here. W whether the right comes in and becomes some t sort of totalitarian because they force you to go to church, I think is a different story. I don't think that's the case. But we're pushing back in such great odds out there that are international and striped that it's going to take a, a movement of just more than talking about it, but actually doing something about it. William? And only faith can do that, so. Um, William, mm -hmm. we'd like to hear your thoughts, please. Well, um, 
thoughts that aren't exactly in answer to your question, but are in the zip code of your question. Um, the, um, zip code's fine. So okay. It's close. Uh, well, maybe the area code of your question. <laughs> um, the, the, um, uh, this phenomenon of, of, of uh, woke capitalism, there are a couple of good essays on Substack by a young guy named uh, Richard Hanania. Um, who is trying to account for the fact that now even, even big business is sort of um, uh, part of the, the left of center enterprise. Why is that, he said. Um, and his, his uh, sort of uh, you know, uh, simplest explanation was that um, people on the left want things more than people on the right. If you look at election results over the past 30 plus years, this country is closely and very evenly divided. Uh, George H.W. Bush in 1988 got 54% of the popular vote. Um, not considered a landslide, really, just a sort of a solid, no doubt about it, victory. Um, no presidential candidate since has, has received that much. Things have been, been very close. Um, elections have gone back and forth. After a long um, uh, period over six decades in the 20th century, where the House and the Senate were almost entirely had Democratic majorities, now they've gone back and forth over the past 30 years several times. So this is a, this is a period of, of sort of political um, competitiveness. But in every other field, apart from where people cast votes, the economy, higher education, journalism, um, um, uh, cultural institutions, so forth. Um, the the um, the left is is advancing steadily. The right is retreating steadily. His explanation is simply that um, people on the left care more about this stuff and do more about it. They donate more money. They go to more protests. They uh, they network and engage more to try to to promote their their point of view. Um, the, the reason for this that he suggests, and I think there's, there's some to this, is that um, at, generally speaking, very generally speaking, um, people whose politics or whose, even if they're not all that political, whose, whose sort of orientation is, is conservative, are um, happier and better adjusted people, and therefore have better things to do with their life than go to, to send off checks and go to meetings and sign petitions and get involved in all of this stuff. Um, this, this is a nice thing for them, but puts them at a disadvantage with people who are uh, sort of chronically uh, tend to be bitter and unhappy and looking for some cause that will set, them, set the world aright and make them feel happier about things. And so there is this, um, the, this sort of built-in <coughs> dynamic that causes everything that does not um, we, we don't get to vote on to sort of move to the left um, of, uh, seemingly of its, of its own momentum, volition. The, um, if, if there's a, um, a, a silver lining in this, it is that uh, when, when we do count the votes, we see that um, there is a, uh, um, a, a kind of a inner disadvantage for the left to having this kind of hegemony over these opinion-forming, opinion-broadcasting institutions. Um, and, and that disadvantage is that they are, um, since they talk incessantly amongst themselves, it's very easy, almost inevitable really, that they would get the idea that opinions about critical race theory or 37 genders, or things that only a few percentage points of the population really believes in or takes seriously, to get the idea that these are, in fact, widely held, widely respected, and non-problematic. Um, then you have election days, and you have these, um, uh, the, 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 this sort of kickback, and oh, wait a minute, this is a problem. Not, Despite what I see every day on my Slack channel at work, uh, lots of people don't actually believe this. The, 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 my country and my Twitter feed are two different things. I thought they were the same. Um, so I, I think that um, 
there, there is um, uh, reason for hope, work to be done, and, and, and simply despite, you know, for, for the fellow conservatives in, in the uh, room, um, d despite being happy and well-adjusted and liking your life and your work and family and so forth, um, uh, of necessity, um, it, we have to sort of up our game. You know, we're at the point uh, in the, uh, where the announcer says in the football game, it, this, it, it's a question of who wants it more. Well, that's, that's sort of where, where we uh, arrive at, at, at this point. Thank you, William. Uh, a next tangential, sh a little bit of a shift in topic. Um, in chapter two, titled Our Pre-Totalitarian Culture, Dreyer attributes some of the possibilities of societal collapse to a lack of faith in institutions. For those of you paying attention to the news recently, 13 Republicans just handed a large win to the Democrats with their vote for the infrastructure bill. On that note, how much do you think our current American institutions are worth having faith in? Why or why not? Is this soft totalitarianism driven by shortcomings in our institution, in, in our institutions themselves? I'll, I'll take it first. I, I don't have any faith in the institutions right now. Um, and I think it's unfortunate. And, and um, I wish I wish I had faith in my government. I wish I had faith in the churches out there. I wish I had faith in the families. I don't disagree with James. I think the family has been hollowed out. And it's been pretty insufferable. I remind people, too, that what happens in D.C. started in Sacramento. You can trace pretty much any major public policy in America back to what happened in Sacramento. And they continue to haul that out. We've been captured by big businesses whose bottom line is more important than our welfare and our, our happiness, um, welfare in the general sense. Um, so yeah, I don't have any faith in institutions. It's gonna have to take somebody who has great charisma, staying power and leadership to, um, for me to follow, to re rebuild these things. But I would encourage each one of you, I see a lot of really impressive people out here. Um, it doesn't just happen coming to these forums and having these conversations, these are fun. But what really happens is the activism that happens in your neighborhood. Um, it's we've got to open our wallets and our homes. I appreciate the several chapters that uh, Rod dedicated to these faithful Christians who open their homes as they're about, you know, to, to people who are about to be interrogated. Um, you know, the institution um, right now in California and the United States, I think, is falling apart. But um, who are we to? Who are we right now? Are we going to stand up and invite people in our homes and really donate to those causes, which makes us work or not? I don't know. Well, so, you know, everyone wants to know what's wrong with the institutions. How did it go so wrong? How did it go wrong so fast? Um, and who do we blame? Uh, and, you know, part of the answer, undoubtedly, is that the wrong people are in charge. People with bad opinions. Bad people, bad opinions equals bad institutions. That's one part of the puzzle. Uh, but what we see coming out of those institutions is that s exact same logic or argument turned around on us. You are the people with bad opinions. You do not deserve to participate in public debate. When you say it, it's misinformation. When you assemble with your friends online or off, you are uh, threatening the integrity and the safety of, uh, of America suddenly. And so I think we need to look a level deeper and recognize that what's wrong with the institutions is that they are not going to survive in a world where everyone has one of these and is plugging it into their brains at all times. We are cyborgs now. And we have to recognize the fact that like, you know, it's not like the old days where you just blow up the factory or you throw the wooden clog into the gears and oh, it's a, you know, we're, we've got the upper hand, you know. It doesn't work that way anymore. It's not even clear what, what a digital war to sort of reclaim our, you know, our agency from these devices would look like. And it's not clear that people actually want to do that on balance. And so, you know, we have institutions that were built for, for a, a prior age of technology. And what we are discovering is that those institutions are failing us and failing to control the technology that we have created. We have a world that is swarmed over with, with uh, digital devices, many of which are invisible, able to do things that have only been associated in the past for all of human history with angels and demons, an infinite number of these things flying around at all times. Um, 5G is coming, that means it's going to be basically zero latency for devices, which means that any device anywhere in the world uh, can communicate with any other device that's networked to it with it almost instantaneously. 
This is transcending human <laughs> space and time. And uh, the, the thought that, that institutions built to rule a world um, in, you know, sort of a, a liberal international sense uh, are, are able to bring, to extend that control over these devices, I think is, is being proven out every day not to be true. Uh, liberal democracy in, in an international way and even at the domestic level is not, is not proving capable of controlling these technologies. And I think that's why you see, you know, on the one hand, something like woke capitalism where you've got the Wokies coming along and they're saying the only way that we can control our technology is if we create a new priestly class of woke ethicists and we put ourselves in charge of everything. <laughs> but it, Ibram Kendi wants to do this in government. Uh, you know, the Google's uh, woke AI ethicists want to do it in Silicon Valley. Um, and you know, we can disagree and say these are, these are bad people with bad opinions, but at least they're recognizing that if there is no sort of moral superstructure in place, then we are going to have an infinite number of machines that don't care about us, that aren't our friends, even though we created them, are indifferent to our cosmic fate, uh, running amok and ruling our lives. Uh, and so at the same time, you know, what you see coming out of, uh, out of government, out of the institutions, is you see uh, liberal elites who are going, oh my gosh, uh, liberalism doesn't work anymore, but we still want to be in power and we still want to think well of ourselves. So we'll just kind of stop being liberal and maybe become you know, illiberal instead. And everything else will stay the same. Uh, and that seems, to be, you know, that seems to be what they're going for. Uh, we'll, ha we'll, we'll, we'll have a, a social credit system, sort of technocracy. Uh, we'll have you know, sort of phase out all of the, the freedoms that people you know, have, have kind of come to think as, as, uh, as inherent to their way of life. Uh, you know, your footprint will shrink. In the future, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Uh, you know, your, your carbon emissions will, will shrink. Um, you'll be sort of transferred into this point system where, you know, if you say the right things and do the right things online, you, your status will go up. And if you do the wrong things, your status will go down. Uh, we're being moved into a system where what happens in the database is more important than what happens outside the database. What happens on screen is more important than what happens off screen. Uh, and that, you know, this virtual world that's being constructed for us uh, is, is considered to be the one where you know, we need to convince everyone to, pay, to care more about what happens in that world than what happens in the real world. Uh, you know, moderation in the sense that the founders would recognize is toast. And moderation in the sense that you know, someone who spends a lot of time on Reddit would recognize is here. Uh, and ultimately, you know, when, you're, when you're doing moderation for you know, social media, you will come quickly to understand that there's no way to do it without surveillance, without prying into the intimate details of everyone's life who's involved in the system. Uh, and so these shifts are, are, are very significant, and this is why you know, we've come to a moment where, uh, where liberalism is, is thrown into doubt and where liberal democracy seems like it's not so hot as it used to be. I mean, it, it wasn't able to, to transform China by opening their markets so they didn't become more like us, and now we, we know right here at home that we can, you know, we can have open markets, so to speak, uh, and, and move further away from our way of life uh, with, with every year that goes by. Um, at the same time, though, we should, we should recognize that you know, our digital devices are powerful enough that now they rule the world in a way that no human or no group of humans can do. So liberalism, I think, is going to have a future if it recognizes that America has always been, in a certain way, a pluralistic country. Different groups of people live their own lives in the, the, the way that they want, uh, and they're able to do so without being treated like second-class citizens. Uh, and that if, if liberalism gives up on global universalism, it has a chance. Uh, no one group of people, no one ideology is going to rule the world. Uh, the technology is too powerful now. Uh, every major civilization state is, is grappling with trying to figure out how they can use their resources to sort of reestablish some control over their machines. You see Russia doing this. China's obviously doing it. But even you know, democracies like India, Israel, everyone's trying to figure out how they can apply their, their deepest resources to restore their culture in a way that will allow their regime to last and to thrive and, and you know, really encourage the health of the people in a digital age. Uh, and that's going to require a renaissance. It's going to require a moral, spiritual renaissance, a willingness to fight a spiritual war, um, and, to not, you know, and to not try to do it the shortcut way, which is by uh, you know, passing uh, uh, draconian moral laws that are meant to apply to everyone. Thank you, James. We're going to now use that as a transition into some questions from the audience. And I've done my best to bundle them, if you will, into common themes. And a common theme that I'm hearing uh, dovetails onto James's comment. 
It's specifically about the elites and also how individuals remain sovereign. So this is a two-part question, but what should the response be to the elite ruling political class who views their fellow Americans as the problem? And how then do we, the people, ensure that the people remain sovereign? So James was talking about action in the broader sense, but perhaps something that's a little bit more tangible. Um, Lance was talking about what we can do at home, um, but what are some more perhaps tangible takeaways for the audience with regards to um, action for ensuring sovereignty, for example? To what uh, Rod had in his book, every end of the chapter, he had the See, Judge, Act um, opportunity. I thought he laid those out very nicely. I, I would take it one step further. I would say learn, act, and then share, right? We really have to testify to our brothers and sisters out there that they've got to do something. They can't be mere um, wallflowers. Uh, when we talk about the elites, I think we give them more power than they, than they deserve. Um, there's a lot of really smart people out there, but if you've ever uh, been with some of these, uh, and I don't know, James probably has more experience than I do here, but just go to Silicon Valley sometime and hang out with these guys. Um, I, I think often we give them way more power, and the fact that we let them into our lives is pretty stunning. Uh, maybe there, there are some options for us to really step back and, and do some different things. Rituals are important, uh, as mentioned in the book as well, and I think that our children need to see us uh, do more than check our, our text messages and Twitter feed every day. They've got to see us go to church and do other things. I think if I'm going to write a book one day, it'll just be three words, go to church. Um, because I really think that uh, regardless of your faith, denomination, confession, yeah, um, if you go to church, you're a part of a community. You're a part of uh, acting for the best of other people. You're in, uh, usually in service to others. And I think that that's the opportunity where you can really retake and recapture these institutions. But it's going to be a long haul. And I, I think that uh, it's overwhelming, especially for those of us who have children and are about to send them out into the world wondering if they're going to survive or not. So I'm not on the panel, but I am a, moderate, a moderator. So I am going to take this liberty. I think it's important for us to note, aren't we also the elites? Right? Aren't we the elites on the right? And maybe a call to action is to say, we need to extend the grace to the left as much as we hope they would extend it to us here on the right. So maybe just that call to action. Um, you know, instead of owning the libs, it's like, hey, what are, the, what do we have in common? Maybe we should grab a beer and go watch a football game together and share, you know, something that we value together as human beings. So just a, a call to extend that to our brothers and sisters over there, maybe on the left-hand side of the aisle. James or Will? Um, well, this sort of goes back to your, your last question before we got to... Um, the audience uh, question uh, about institutions and and uh, elites and the populace and that. Um, I mean, w William Buckley was not a uh, not the kind of guy you'd expect to find having a beer at the VFW, but um, <laughs> but uh, he he sort of gave the the ultimate uh, uh, summary of the case for popularism when he he said uh, famously that he'd rather be governed by the first thousand names in the Boston phone book than the, the faculty of Harvard University. Um, and I, I think that um, the, uh, the, the sort of discrediting of the elites of the institutions, I mean, it, you don't have to, um, don't have to look necessarily at, at uh, sort of abstract uh, terms about that. Just Consider here in California, um, Pat Brown was governor from 1958 to 1966. Eight years, big Democratic majorities in the state legislature. Uh, he built this huge water system that was uh, uh, absolutely essential to the growth of the state. Um, many of the freeway projects that um, um, have defined the state went up uh, during that period. His son is, uh, has this second stint as governor in f from, what was it, two 2010 to 2018, um, he commits to the same sort of idea of a, a legacy uh, project that's, that's going to define his governorship in historical memory the way the, the water and freeway system did his father's, and it's the high-speed uh, train thing that has been, um, you know, um, 
it, they're struggling to get one leg of it in the middle of the uh, nowhere. Um, and it's, so the, the question is, um, uh, uh, this, this is, I think, an inherently interesting question. How is it that we've gotten worse at doing things we used to do capably? Why, why can't stuff get built anymore? And I think that the, um, you know, in a funny way, it's, um, it's not the entirely or simply the incompetence of the elites, the sort of acquired inability to do things, but also that um, um, we, we've come up with a, um, a sort of perverted notion of democracy, which means that, that we are, there is going to be popular input, uh, as they say, on, on how these things are done. But it's not going to take the form of simply voting for a government and then it having the power to do things. Instead, there are going to be, in the course of every, um, every big undertaking, there are going to be 100 choke points at which some uh, interest group, some uh, litigant, um, somebody or other can intervene, slow things down. You do that enough, you make things impossible. Um, there was nothing in, in a, a sort of a small descent democratic about having Robert Moses build all this stuff all over the state of New York. Um, Robert Carroll wrote this famous book, The Power Broker, about all the ways he, he bent and, and twisted the idea of, of uh, representative government. On the other hand, things got built. The, the place got changed. New York would be, and, and New York is one of the only sort of um, snow belt cities that did not lose population over the last four decades of the 20th century. This is not a coincidence. So I think that um, be, before we simply um, um, commit ourselves to this um, convenient binary of populists and elites, that we have to look at the ways that, um, uh, in a sense, the problem is um, that not that, that the uh, non-elites have, have been disdained and deprived of power, but that um, the, the, the ways in which people can express themselves and have an impact on what the big institutions do has become so clotted and complicated um, that, um, uh, that it's, it discredits the institutions, it discredits the elites, it discredits the idea of self-government. Um, we, we, we need to do fewer things, but do them better. Thank you, William. We are coming up on time. Unfortunately, we're going to squeeze in one more question, and I think this summarizes quite a few questions that I've been getting about churches and the relationship between church leadership and governance. What do the panelists feel is the best response as members of church bodies to the lockdown and mass measures, vaccine measures? Where do we draw the line between compliance, quote, giving to Caesar what is Caesar's, and standing up against unjust requirements? Uh, okay, so th this might sound like a, a somewhat strange answer to this question, but I think it's, it's an important one, so I'm going to give it a go. Um, <laughs> It really is true that there's a distinction between the technological elite and the technological sort of commoners. And um, many, you know, I think many Americans who love America uh, would perhaps consider themselves members of the elite, maybe not in good standing, except for the fact that they really feel like they have no control over the development or use of technology in the country. Um, and this touches on religion um, in the following way. Uh, if there was a presence in not just sort of websites and, and the like, but in the, the technological architecture of the world that we live in, if there was a strong religious presence of established and organized religion within the way that our digital world had been constructed and with the way that it, it sort of practices what it does, the way that it operates, then I think we'd be living in a much different world. Um, and I think that, you know, that, that people who feel uh, that they... Um, are, are somehow, whether it's too old or too ignorant or just you know, kind of miss the boat, whatever it is, many excuses for why people feel like they can't uh, intervene in the way technology is being developed and advanced in this country. Um, if people of faith uh, and people of you know, intelligence and, and dedication care about their country, if they realize that it was actually not as difficult as it seems to kind of grab the wheel a little bit of our technological development, I think that that would make a big difference in the life of churches, in the life of communities, in the life of our country. Um, yeah, you know, I've, I've got a book coming out on, on these topics uh, in a little over a week, I think. I'm, I'm not going to flog the book, but I do want to say that like, 
the, James the thing that was for the book. <laughs> the thing that motivated me to to write, you know, at length about this is is that there is a way that people, you know, ordinary folks, um, can can make a concerted effort to kind of take control of our technological destiny back, um, and and that way is through Bitcoin. Um, it is possible to do what I did with this book, which is to publish it on the blockchain, have it for sale in in cryptocurrency. Um, and it is a way that you can that you can tell compute what to do. You can tell the databases what to do. It, in these days, if you're not computing, you're being computed. We've got an elite that owns and controls all the databases and wants us to just exist in those uh, databases and be happy little digits. If there's a better way. We can use this technology through Bitcoin to actually create things of value, things that are memorable, things that that we can that we can use to protect and defend our humanity and our way of life. It's sitting right there, and you know the the folks in charge are starting to circle and going like, is this something we need to destroy or take over? And you know this is an opportunity for us, you know even those of us who are sort of elites and not very good standing, to uh, to assert ourselves, to organize ourselves, and to really use the technology that's there right now to do things that protect our humanity that and, and give us you know, an opportunity to have fun, to create new things, to uh, to bring back some of the the local associationism that that is oftentimes missing. Um, and to use our skills and abilities to, uh, you know, to, to, to defend our people, uh, to strengthen our country, uh, and to protect our humanity in the face of, you know, I, I think, a, a big alternative that's going in a very bad direction. Will or Lance, any last thoughts? Yeah, about just one last thought. I think that uh, we've got to defend that, which is uh, true and beautiful and virtuous. Uh, I think we can do that and make a lot of strides. I like what uh, Austin Farrar said in, in uh, his biography on C.S. Lewis. He said it's, quote, it is commonly said that if rational argument is so seldom the cause of conviction, is so seldom the cause of conviction, philosophical apologists must largely be wasting their shot. The premise is true, true, but the conclusion does not follow. For though argument does not create conviction, the lack of it destroys belief. What seems to be proved may not be embraced, but what no one shows the ability to defend is quickly abandoned. Rational argument does not create belief but it maintains a climate in which belief may flourish. And I think that's what the university is appropriately doing. Thank you, Pete, for the work and leadership you do here at Pepperdine. And I think we've got to be out defending that which is virtuous, lovely, and of good report and praiseworthy. Thank you, Lance. Will, any lasting thoughts? Excuse me. Uh, sure. Uh, completely unrelated to everything we've been saying. Um, um, uh, in, his, uh, in his lunch talk, Rod mentioned uh, Wesley Yang, who has been trying to um, um, define wokeism and uh, offered the, the, the useful term successor ideology. Um, uh, and I, I read uh, Yang quite a bit, and, and I, think, I think that gets us further along, but still doesn't pin it down, what it, what it is exactly that the social justice warriors believe, on what basis do they go out and, and do their battles. Um, but uh, I, I think a, um, not the entirety, but a big part of the successor ideology is what we could call um, identitarian essentialism, that, um, that people and their grievances and their uh, identity slots sort of go a long ways in defining who they are, the claims they have, the privileges they have, the duties they have, uh, and so forth. And um, though I'm not um, much of an optimist myself, I wouldn't hire myself as a motivational speaker. Uh, I'll, uh, if, if, um, if, if, um, if I'm having something that sounds like the last word here, I'll say that, that there is, um, uh, there is increasing evidence that this identitarian essentialism is, is in fact not politically popular, is, is very hard to sell. I was looking at some numbers the other day. In, in 1996, California um, passed uh, Prop 209, the California Civil Rights Initiative, that made affirmative action in public education and contracting and, and employment unconstitutional under the California State Constitution. Um, that uh, uh, that uh, uh, on election day, on, on a presidential election day in 1996, that passed by about 55 percent to 45 percent. The exit polls show that the California electorate 25 years ago was about 74 percent white. Uh, in 2020, um, Prop 
16 was on the ballot that was going to repeal Prop 209. Um, it, uh, Prop 16 lost by a bigger margin than Prop 209 won 24 years before. Uh, uh, Prop 16 only got 43% of the vote, 57% affirmed affirmative action, despite the fact that in the intervening 24 years, um, the electorate, the state population had changed to the point where um, uh, uh, the California electorate in, in the 2020 election was 49% white. What, what this says to me is that um, this itinerarian essentialism, the, this, this core politics of, of victimhood and grievance um, is, is not very popular in particular among, as, as California has got less white, affirmative action has got less popular. This, this tells us that um, the, the idea that people are simply the sum of their grievances and their, the, the, um, the historical um, 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 misdeeds that have been done to people who look like them is in fact not a winning uh, argument in, in our political system. That the, the, um, the inherent condescension of this argument, uh, that because your fill in the blank uh, minority group, uh, 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 un underprivileged group, um, that therefore um, we can't expect much from you, we don't ask much from you, um, that uh, your, your only role in the, in the political drama of our self-government is to be, to be uh, aggrieved and to, to have these claims on the people who um, are uh, uh, your oppressors, that this, this in fact is not playing very well even among the people who stand to, to receive tangible benefits from it. So th this tells me that um, uh, despite the, uh, the uh, hegemony of the successor ideology in a certain strata of American society, that when it, when it uh, has to recommend itself to a broader portion of the population and they get to vote on it, it has big problems. And on that note, please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>